My friends, it's a delight to be with you and worship this very fine Sunday morning. As you can see, I'm not in the pulpit. I was afraid if I stood up there that the choir might pull a bolt if I went a little long. So I came down here so they can't get me. But then they set up this close, so I don't know, maybe they can still get me. Friends, it is so good to be with you, even amidst the construction. This is your Heritage Fund dollars hard at work. That's the endowment that we have put together to ensure the preservation of this historic place. If you would like to know more about that, a staff member can point you to a trustee or someone else to help you understand how you can be a part of the enduring legacy of the ministry here in its physical form as well as a spiritual form from, for the next 100 years, hopefully even more. And uh, friends, it's just a delight to have to come in here and, and have the opportunity to sit on this side because of progress. Some of you are a little ambivalent about it. I heard somebody say, I never sit on that side. That's the sinner's side. I don't know where the sinners sit, but I'm thankful that probably all of us with sin in our lives have the grace of God. Amen. I'd like you to start quietly with your eyes closed. And I want you to think about one thought for a moment. Just comfortably sit. And I want you to think about an act of compassion that has made room in your life for you to flourish one act, at least one act of compassion that loved you into the existence that you have. As you take hold of that memory and feeling, breathe in, breathe in gratitude, and exhale. Breathe in the breath of God. God of all the cosmos, you are the author of life, the creator of all things created. You are the king of our hearts, the king of the universe, the king of all things known and unknown. And we've gathered here together to bend the knee under your authority. It is your sovereignty and your will that has called us to yourself and God, we know it's not simply your will or simply your authority or simply your power that attracts our attention, but it is your love. Your love is that lure that pulls us deeper into an existence that we could not have otherwise imagined, save for your demonstration of love on a cross for our salvation and for the renewing of the world. That's why we're here. And God, whether anyone else knows it or not, you and I certainly know that without you, I can do nothing. So we ask together that your Holy Spirit fall upon this place and everywhere my voice may be heard that these, these words that have been prayerfully meditated upon, that have been studied and thought through, that they would somehow have meaning beyond what I intend, that they would have meaning that would give life to not only the hearers, but the speaker. You are God. And we ask that you be here. It is in the matchless name of your Son, our Savior, Christ the Lord, that we pray and God's people together say, Amen. This Thursday, I had to pick up my daughter and her friend from school. They had to play practice after school. And I love picking them up because they pile into the car and I hear the gossip and all the exciting things that they were doing in the school. Now, I like to say things that make me sound a little less than cool, a little nerdy, just so I can connect with them. I mean, because the thing of it is, is I, I really am cool. So I, I don't like to alienate them. So I like to show them, you know, it's a little bit of condescension to show them that I can be into their world. So I like to say a lot of things like, hey, anybody riz you up today or, you know, and, and they, and they just love it. They think that, man, I heard my daughter's friend say, Mr. Longbonds is the coolest guy I've ever met. And this is all true. So I like talking with them and hearing about their life. And, and I heard on that day, my daughter, I said, so, so what happened today? And she said, uh, oh, we had a substitute in this class. And I thought, a substitute. You see, I remember when I too was a little demon, I mean child, and I remember substitutes. I remember that was the day that the kids would get into all kinds of hijinks and tomfoolery. They all thought they were the smartest brightest bulb in the bunch and they thought they could trick the substitute but they couldn't it just made class kind of exhausting but nevertheless I wanted to find out if my daughter and her friend were those kids or if they were 
you know, the kids that follow the rules. And, and then I found out it was a disaster for my daughter. She said that, you see, her teacher had made her a section leader in the class. And I go, say what? And she goes, yeah, yeah. So, so when the substitute came in, the substitute said, the sections le section leaders, they know the plan for class. So the section leaders will tell their groups, their sections, what we're supposed to do today. And I go, oh God, no. You see, because I am, if nothing, I at least want to be a good parent. I'm trying. And my desire to be a good parent means that I also want my kid to be liked. And no section leader enforcing the rules of a teacher who's not there when a substitute there is going to be liked. And so I listened to her with bated breath, wondering how much trouble she got herself in with her, with her friends. And she told me that her section was full of friends. And if they weren't friends, they were friends of friends. And so they were like acquaintances, but they were in the same kind of mind as a student, you know? And she said, yeah, I, I had to sit there. And I told them, you know what we're supposed to do? And I read the instructions and, and, and they just wouldn't listen to me. And spoken with all the authority of somebody who actually didn't have any authority, that is to say power, to make any change. She spoke up with that strange hollow authority and said, now if you don't do what you're supposed to do, I'm going to be forced to put your name on the board. Honey, you didn't say that. I had to. It was my responsibility. I could tell her what was going on. She didn't want to hear it in the moment. I, I could tell her that your friends don't want you as an authority over them. But the thing is, is authority is a tricky thing for most of us in our culture, I think. I have seen presidents and new coaches for NFL teams and CEOs and pastors of churches that everyone wanted to give the authority of leadership to, and then they got that authority, and then it was, well, easy to become critical and harsh and questioning of authority. It's so easy after the promise is there, once it's attained that authority, to then kind of undermine it. Yeah, it's something that's tricky for us. You want to know why? As a species, us Americans or Westerners, we don't like authority. We have been sold a philosophical bill of goods that says that we are autonomous beings. Autos, self, namos, law. We are laws unto ourselves, but here's the thing of it. Not morally, not ethically, not genetically. In no way, shape, or form have we ever been a law unto ourselves. We are always needy, reliant upon others, and we always operate within hierarchies, whether or not we like it or not. It simply does not hold true. Yet, the imagination that we are laws unto ourselves is the thing that we hold on to firmly, and so we question authority all the time. And there are also good reasons to question authority. Because we've seen authority and it not work. We've seen authority be manipulated by power and corrupted by power, and we've seen it be bungled and dropped. Watergate is on mine. I've been reading and watching things about Watergate lately, and I, right there, whether or not every president cuts corners or not is not my argument, but here's one that was so insecure for power, so worried for losing it, that they cut corners legally, big time, majorly, and by the way, they blundered that, and the whole blundering of it all, the American population discovered there was a whole lot of things that the government wasn't telling them, which has spurned a whole lot of that feeling generations later of, what do we not know? We can't trust. We can't trust. We can't trust. A couple of generations later, we would hear about weapons of mass destruction. Listen, I'm not entering into any politics with you. I'm not, I'm not telling you what I thought about it then or what I think about it now. Rest assured, I have a point of view, as you do too. But what we do know is that at least how the material was taught, communicated, manipulated, or spun, somewhere authority broke down and somewhere people felt lied to or at least misled, or at least that the facts were not really facts. And it's caused more questions of authority. Just one president later, President Obama, he decided that the hallmark of his entire presidency was gonna be health care reform. And so he passed the Affordable Care Act, which I think is funny, that's what it's called. It was not called Obamacare, but now everyone calls it Obamacare. And I don't really mind today what you think of it. Maybe you thought it was a great idea, or maybe you didn't think it went far enough. Maybe you thought it was a terrible idea. But what I do know is commentators on both sides of the aisle both agree now that it was crammed through 
And some of the ways in which it was talked about were questionable, especially about the legalities of having to have uh, health care. The point being is authority, not done properly, definitely has made us ugh, at least feel icky about it in our work. So we don't like it. Genetically, as Americans, we have questions about it. Our experience shows that authority goes wrong, so we struggle with it. But the truth is, and here's the deep truth, you can't live without it. You simply need authority. Authority or leadership or power is about order. It is not about power for its own self. You see, if I were wrapped up in the mid-century patriarchal understanding of certain biblical texts, I would assert my authority over the household in a pretty heavy-handed sort of way. I don't know if you're catching what I'm saying, but you can peel back the onion layers at home at lunch with what I really think. But here's the deal. Let me throw out a thought experiment for you. If my wife were a physician, and she's not, but if she were a physician and I were at home and I noticed that my daughter had broken her leg running down the steps or something like that, it would be foolhardy. It would be silly. It would be backwards for me to holler at everyone in the family to stop what they're doing and to listen to me. I am in charge here. You submit to my authority. It would make no sense. I'm not a physician. I can't heal you. I cannot lower your blood pressure. I can raise it. If my wife were a physician, it would make sense for me to submit to her because Real authority, real submission is about order, about making things happen appropriately. That's all. Right now, let me tell you something that's happening right now. If you haven't figured it out, you are submitting to me right now because I'm speaking and you are listening. Later on, when I have conversation with some of you and you speak, I will submit to you. It's a reciprocal sort of hierarchy or authority that with a conversation. So I'm suggesting to you that though we find authority icky, it's also necessary and it happens naturally in the world. I'm also saying this, realizing what I said last Sunday, that we live in an age of suspicion where quite frankly, we just run amok with suspicion over anything that smells of authority and power. It simply is not American. It's simply the philosophical ethos of our day, which is interesting because you come to church today and if you're a Christian, you've come here because you've claimed something about your beliefs. You have claimed that you believe in a God of all creation and that you are not a creator, but you yourself are a creature. And by definition, if you are not God and there is a God, then you have to bend your knee to the authority of that which is God. By definition, you are subservient to someone else. And if you're not and you're a seeker with us today, you've come in with that sense You've come in thinking about coming and thinking about something much larger and beyond yourself. We can talk about it metaphysically and ontologically or ethically, but the reality is we know this. None of us are the God of the universe. We assume there is. We hope there is. Our faith is that there's a God who's called all this into existence and that one that we look to. So therefore, to be a person of faith requires us to have some belief and authority. And what's more, since that authority has taken the shape of a person named Jesus Christ, we say that Jesus has come to bring the kingdom of God. And if there is a kingdom, then there is a king. And if there is a king, then there is leadership and authority. And there is a submission on my part to be part of the kingdom of God. So, authority is a strange thing. But it's present in our text. You see, Jesus has been teaching and he's come to this little village and he's in Capernaum, as it's called. He's in the synagogue and he's teaching and people are curious about him. They say, who is this? He's teaching as one with authority. What does that mean? He's not teaching like the scribes or maybe like other rabbis. You see, in the tradition of the day, it was very popular to teach based on what other people said. You might say about a text, a topic, an idea. Well, Rabbi Stone said this, but Rabbi Ginelat said that, and Rabbi Bell said something different. And on those things, I will tell you something else to think about or another way to consider it. And so the authority is based on what's come before. I was once trying to understand how laws were written, and so I asked a lawyer friend to talk to me like a second grader, explain to me how the laws come into be. And he simply said, ah, oh, it's all precedent. Now, 
I know it's more complicated than that, but think about it for just a quick moment. Anytime we hear about the, the Supreme Court making an opinion, writing an opinion piece, they are always trying to show that their opinions follow the precedent of other courts and other rulings. It's like it has to have been somewhat said somewhere to say it more later. The authority is based on tradition. But here's this one named Jesus who's come in and taught differently. You catch it elsewhere in the Gospels. Have you, can you recall whenever you hear the Gospels say, Jesus saying this, you have heard it said before, but now I say unto you. What's that mean? Well, you've heard all the rabbis say, you've heard the, the scribes suggest, you've heard it, you've read it written, but I'm going to tell you something new, something different, something fresh. Friends, when Jesus spoke, he spoke as though he were the source of authority, as if he were the author of the text. That's the uniqueness that Jesus has brought to the teaching. And, and the people here are not wary of authority in this little synagogue. They are remarking on it because it's interesting. It's strange. It's different. But the authority goes beyond teaching. There is someone there who has a, a possessed spirit by a demon, an unclean spirit. Now, this is a terrifying notion to many of us. I'm assuming that most of us who don't want to think about it just write this all off as a mental health issue. But I would even suggest to you that if the Bible is only talking about mental health problems in a pre-scientific way, those scare us too. Being in church and having this sort of disruption would be scary. And I'm assuming some of you have seen a horror film or two. We've seen horror films about demonic possessions. And you know what I think scares us the most about those? is that so often the priests or the pastors or the rabbis or whomever is there, they actually don't have any authority at all. They really do battle with these spirits and it seems like they lose. That is indeed a scary idea. There's something out there that you cannot see that can change a person and it can defeat you in your good faith. That is scary. I get it. But here's Jesus. Not just a teacher with authority, but a healer of authority authority over the physical realm. He can, he can heal afflictions, but authority over the spiritual as well. He casts and calls that demonic presence out. And there's a loud scream in church. That would terrify us too, wouldn't it? A loud scream in church before this person is healed. And people, again, they sit there in church and what are they talking about? They're not offended by his authority. They don't find it icky. They find it curious. But you and I, we have a problem with authority, don't we? I'm not sure if we trust it. So is it good news to come to church today to have the preacher stand before you and tell you to get in line with the authority of God? How can I tell you that when we struggle as a society to have trust in any authority? Well, I believe something about Jesus. What you see Jesus do, I believe, shows us exactly the heart of the Father. And so here's the thing. I want you to follow it. Did Jesus come in like some spaghetti western, pushing open louvered doors with that do 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 wah, wah, wah in the background? He healed the clicks of his boots on the wood, dusty wood floor and the little clattle noise, is that a word? And the spurs. Is he coming in to do business with the evil one, with the black hat? As Jesus wears the white hat, tough. That's not how Jesus brings authority at all. Jesus didn't move with authority, a heavy hand. Jesus didn't move with a culture war. Jesus moved first with compassion. Compassion. You ever consider the word compassion? What does compassion mean? Well, the prefix com means with and passion. What is passion? Oh, I love this. Let me tell you what passion is not. Passion is not that deep thing that excites you in the soul, deep down on the, the inside of you, the place that you cannot see that gets you out of bed to do eight hours of work in the morning or gets you inspired to get through all your finals so you can go to graduation and be told from some guy in a funny hat how you got to be passionate about things in the world and excited because you can change the world and it's all excitable and exciting and wonderful and good and it's a vision board that you can put up on your wall with the things that you're passionate about. Passion means pain. You ever hear the passion of Jesus Christ? Not the movie, 
There's a reason the movie's called that, because the passion, the word passion is about anguish, pain, suffering. If you are a person of compassion, it means you have entered into the pain of another person. You have entered into the wounds of another human being or another group of people. You have entered into their mess to be with them. Compassion is deeply related to another concept in the scriptures, and that is the womb of a mother. For those of you who have had the blessing of birthing a child, I want you to think about what it has meant for your body to birth a child, the pain and the agony that it took to birth a child. And is that something, I can't think of anything that describes the word with more than a child who has been with the child's mother. It's a withness that blows my mind, except for I'm a product of it too, just like you. Compassion carries the same sort of import and pain and suffering and love as maternal birth. Jesus does not come strong. He doesn't come in strong and vicious. He doesn't come in like a masculine warrior crying freedom. He doesn't come in with a sword. He comes in with compassion. He comes in and enters into our pain. And only from there comes the authority. I believe that so often the church wants to get behind people we're going to make a change. We want to, we want to le- leverage a culture war. We want to change society. We want to win the world for Jesus. We want to get people's hearts and minds right, so hopefully they'll vote right, which means vote the same way I would vote, right? We want to break society the way we think society ought to be, but here's the thing. If we wage that kind of authority over the world, the best that the church will do is crucify the world. That's the best that we ever do when we fight the world. We crucify the world instead of being those who ourselves are crucified for the world. I do remember someone saying, take up your cross and follow me. Never saying, take up nails and hammer and chase after thee. Until you bring authority after compassion, you will have authoritarianism. Authoritarianism only there, my friends. You will not have an authority that matters to make a difference anywhere. And I think if we listen to the words of Jesus and we see what he does and we pick it apart the way we just picked it apart, we will see that the morality is so opaque even in the life of the church. It is as opaque as a wet tissue. We are called to so much more. Why is it that I stand before churches, I get online, I answer interviews on the radio sometimes, and I talk to people and I say things like this. I say that we should stop killing people in Gaza. And people get mad. And people get mad and say that I must be anti-Israel. But then I say that we must be against anti-Semitism and we must be for returning hostages and have Hamas take account for their crimes. And then I'm a Zionist. Why why does the church fall into two simple categories? It's much more morally complicated than that, isn't it? it? Why can't we have the moral courage to follow Jesus, to enter into compassion, to look at people who look different than us, believe differently than us, and may be a threat to us and not see an angry enemy but someone to have, who has pain that we can enter in with them. I have met far too many Christians for these last 22 years, 20, since 2001, who make it too easy to just want to kill anybody who's Arabic simply because there are Islamic extremists in the world. You get mad at me all you want. It's just not Christian. It's not Christian to deny the human dignity of in a person is not Christian to deny the image of Godness on another person, and it is not Christian to want war. I understand it's complex, but to want it, to foment for it, to think that that's the only moral solution. Also, why should we be hollered at to stand with our Jewish brothers and sisters? Why should we be uh, questioned because we do think hostages should be returned? I'm not trying to tell you what to think, except to say, don't be ideological. Take any authority the scriptures give you. Take authority of Christ with you. Follow with compassion and see these are real human being people with needs. Do you want an exciting life? Do you want an interesting one? You want something worth living for? Not just punching a clock and going to bed for, but one living for? 
try to figure out what it means to follow the authority of Jesus in this world the way Jesus did it, by leading first with compassion, by entering into the pain of brothers and sisters who you vilely disagree with. What does it mean to enter into the pain of a brother or sister who holds abhorrent views, but to still enter into their pain that you may bring them love? 21st century is trying to still figure out ways of being together, still trying to figure out ways to be a united society, and we're not doing it. May I suggest something small that is actually huge? Put down authority until you get compassion right. I'm going to close with these words from Simone Weil, a great 20th century philosopher in her book, Gravity and Grace. She says it better than I could. She reflects on the cross. Whoever takes up the world shall perish. Whoever takes up the sword, think authority, power, violence. Whoever takes up the sword shall perish by the sword. And whoever does not take up the sword or lets it go shall perish on the cross. Friends, don't crucify the world. Don't crucify your brother or sister who's got pain. We've all got pain. But live a life crucified for them, that you may know them, you may enter in, and from there comes the change. From there is the revolution.